From 1991 until 1996, the trifecta saw the release of seven Spider-Man games, five on the Genesis, one on the Sega CD, and one on the 32X. There seems to be a lot of debate about what ones are worth playing and what ones should be avoided. I covered Spider-Man Web of Fire for the 32X in episode two. From here on out, we'll be reviewing these in the order of release. Next up is Spider-Man on the Genesis, also known as the Amazing Spider-Man vs. Kingpin for the Sega CD. This is Retro Impressions and Reviews, a show dedicated to answering if video games from the past are still worth your time today. Spider-Man was an exclusive game developed by Sega and first released on the Genesis and Master System in 1991. A Game Gear release came in 1992 and finally a release for the Sega CD in 1993. For this review, we're going to stick to the 16-bit versions, starting with the Genesis release. This game is often referred to as Spider-Man vs. Kingpin due to three reasons. First, even though the title of the game is just Spider-Man, the title screen shows Spider-Man vs. Kingpin. Second, when it was released for Sega CD, it was under the title The Amazing Spider-Man vs. Kingpin. And finally, there was another game released on the Genesis under the same title, Spider-Man. In collector circles today, this is referred to as Spider-Man, the animated series, and we will be reviewing this game in a later episode. With that, let's get into the game. Did you know Kingpin was originally a Spider-Man villain? In fact, his first appearance was in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 50, so it's rather fitting that he would find his way into a game as the main protagonist at some point. The story is set up in the manual via four pages of comic book panels. Kingpin has hijacked the TV airways and convinced the public that Spider-Man is a terrorist who has planted a bomb that will blow up within New York City in 24 hours. Kingpin has hired six supervillains along with their henchmen to ensure the plan's success, giving them the five keys needed to disarm it. The rest of the story, along with a rehash of what's in the manual, is played out throughout the game. This is a timed action platformer. You're given a convenient HUD that displays the time remaining before the bomb goes off, along with your health and remaining web. If you pause the game, there are a few things you can do. You can equip the web shield, your camera, or head back to your apartment where you can rest up by trading valuable time to regain health. Also displayed is how many keys you have. You start off on a very short stage, head through the window into what I'm guessing is your apartment, and you're treated with more story. Spider-Man, now realizing the whole city is against him, has no choice but to clear his name. Camera in hand, you set off to find Doc Ock. The camera is a really cool aspect of the game. It's worked into the story that pictures need to be taken so Spider-Man can clear his name and, of course, earn some cash. You're given a limited amount of film each level and can take pictures of whatever pleases you. The more dangerous the enemy in the picture, the more it's worth. Every picture is sold to the newspaper at the completion of a level and the money is used to refill your webs. Anyways, word on the street has it that Dr. Octopus is held up in a warehouse. Once there, navigate through the warehouse taking down the thugs standing in your way. They're equipped with guns, knives, and keep to a predictable pattern. Eventually, you'll hit what I think is a mid-boss. It's a guy driving a forklift. This guy works me over more than Doc Ock does every time. Anyways, knock out the driver, then take down Doc Ock and obtain the first key. You get to read an exchange between Spider-Man and the Doc where it's revealed that the Lizard, Sandman, and at least two others are holding the remaining four keys, and they are all needed to disarm the bomb. It's a nice touch for anyone who didn't catch this in the manual before playing the game. So into the sewers we go. There are rats, bats, alligators, and some mutant creatures jumping all over the place. When you reach the end, you'll have the lizard to contend with and Venom will make an appearance if you push too far left. Once he's beat, you'll get a second key and get to read a short exchange between Spider-Man and the lizard. 
nothing important is learned, so it's off to find Sandman in the park. That is, until Kingpin jacks the airwaves again, telling the public that Spider-Man has gone crazy. A great cutscene follows, where you see Spider-Man working out what to do next. You're able to see the thought process that leads to him figuring out where these illegal broadcasts are coming from. The City Power Plant. This is a super short level, but it's cool nonetheless. You work your way into the main power plant by avoiding electrical charges and dispatching some street thugs along with a couple small enemies that seem to be composed entirely of electricity. Once you reach the electrical transmission towers, move quickly to the top to take down Electro. It's a super easy fight as he's on a Nimbus and every time he flies up, you can just shoot him right back on down. You'll finish this fight much faster than the third hardest boss in the entire game, the forklift driver. With Electro down, you now have three keys and we're off to see the Sandman in Central Park. Guys with assault rifles are waiting to greet you along with snakes in what I feel is the second toughest boss in the game, a large ape. There isn't much else here, still it was quite a chore to figure out the end fight as you can't defeat Sandman by using traditional means. Again, Venom makes an appearance, but it's an easy fight once you figure out the solution. With the fourth key in hand, and no clue as to who has the fifth, we head downtown to see who might be looking for us. You'll need to take down the brutal biker, Hoggoblin who happens to have the fifth key, and finally Venom. Cue a short cutscene of Mary Jane getting kidnapped, and we receive another transmission from King Pin letting Spider-Man know where he can be found. It appears that the end is finally here. Next up is a really odd Robocop themed level and it's rather confusing as to how it's relevant or even fits into the game. It's not difficult to navigate and you're quickly through it without a boss fight. It really feels like a nod to those other superhero games that were completely out of touch with the source material. Anyways, disarming the bomb is next and there are many ways to tackle this. It's being guarded by four of the previous bosses. You can choose to defeat them all, some of them, or none of them. Once the bomb is disarmed, the remaining villains will take off, leaving you to face King Pin one-on-one, -on -one, and this is a hard, hard fight. You need to utilize the very limited amount of time you're given to take down King Pin before Mary Jane is burned alive. The game can end in three ways here. King Pin can take you down, Mary Jane can die before you save her, or you could take down King Pin. Now, I never die to King Pin's hand, but I've lost so many times due to Mary Jane dying. It's not even funny. He's extremely hard to hit, and the clock goes quick. Then, one game, I, a person who has very coincidentally owned this game since it was new, discovered something possibly everyone who's played this besides myself knows. What's the trick? Well, I discovered you can web up the hoist that's lowering Mary Jane, temporarily stopping it. Once I discovered this, it was game over. Mary Jane was saved, the Kingpin was arrested, and Spider-Man's name was finally cleared. Although it's a bit of a recap, I think it's really cool that an action game this old has six possible endings. Spider-Man gets arrested and doesn't break out, the time runs out and the bomb explodes, you screw up disarming the bomb and it explodes, you get to the end game but can't save Mary Jane in time so she dies, Kingpin kills you, and the real ending where you defeat Kingpin and save the girl. So let's look at some of the common complaints people seem to have starting with the gameplay and controls. Honestly, I'm a little lost in what people are talking about here is I think the controls are fine. I saw complaint after complaint of people having issues sticking to the ceiling. Now I found it rather frustrating that I couldn't transition from the ceiling to other surfaces, but getting on the ceiling was never much of an issue. It's more a matter of getting the coordination down required to do so. Do that and this won't be a problem. People also take major issue with the limited web cartridges. I personally love this as it keeps in line with the comics of the time. This also brings into play something else the game does remarkably well. It incorporates Peter Parker's profession as a freelance photographer into the game in a way that actually matters by making it the only way to afford the material needed 
to refill your web shooters. Speaking of refilling your web shooters, this game has a serious issue with the icons representing pickups. They're mislabeled again and again, making it impossible to know what you're picking up beforehand. Obviously, this doesn't affect gameplay, but it's interesting nonetheless. The 24-hour time limit is also a commonly stated problem. Timers linked to gameplay such as the one on the final stage of Spider-Man for the 32X typically drive me bonkers, but the time allotted here is beyond generous, and the fact that it's story-driven and not linked to a timer that exists strictly because it was popular to put in place makes the difference to me. It's also directly linked onto how many times you can try a level over. The way the system works is that time slowly ticks down as you play. You also lose about two hours off the clock every time you get knocked out and taken to jail. I like this much more than having X number of lives and then being given a game over. So why am I okay with this while others are not? Well, for me, it gives the game a certain challenge that allows me to try a level over and over again until I'm proficient at it without letting me breeze through the entire game. Why might others dislike this? Well, I think perfecting a level and moving on only to lose the game due to time running out can be a bit disheartening, especially near the end levels. So I disagree, but I understand. So what about the graphics and art style? There seems to be a mixed response here, so let me tell you that the graphics and backgrounds are average to below average at best. As I'm sure you've noticed by watching thus far, this game has terrible backgrounds or just a complete lack of them in most levels. Still, the art style is spot on. All the sprites are very well done and absolutely capture the full essence of the characters they represent. I also really appreciate that each villain is found in a very appropriately designed level, one where you might expect to find them in the comic book. I really like the fact that the game moves along at a nice clip. It does a lot of things right while never really excelling beyond the standard mark of acceptable. The game's difficulty is in what I consider to be a sweet spot, and it's a ton of fun learning the various levels. The humor and writing style really capture the feeling of the comics, something that had rarely if ever been done up to this point or for some time after. Sadly, everything beyond what I just mentioned is just average. Nothing is broken, not much is bad, but most of the good is in a very narrow segment. As I stated earlier in this video, I still own my original copy of this game. Sadly, until making this review, I hadn't played it since 1995. And it's a shame nearly 22 years have passed is this a bit better than letting 22 years come and go between playthroughs. In 1993, a version was released for the Sega CD. I've heard this often referred to as the definitive version, but so many changes have been made it's more like a version B or Spider-Man Remixed. I really have an issue with the direction the story takes in this version. It's altered in a way that just makes it silly. Unlike the very plausible story in the Genesis version, where it's clear from the start that Spider-Man is at odds with law enforcement, he's BFFs with them in the Sega CD version. Good work, Spider-Man. That young man is a real hero. He certainly is, ma'am. Having it make zero sense that the city police are going to take someone's word on TV as gospel without giving the benefit of the doubt to the superhero they're shown to be friendly with at the start of the game. In fact, the story is affected in a fairly negative way, due to this version having a quasi open world map to explore. You can go where you want, by who you want, in any order that you like, but it kills the flow of the story. It just feels completely disjointed, unlike the Genesis version. This one doesn't take itself serious at all. Things like Fisk using a pirate television station in the Genesis version, as opposed to being given airtime by the new station in the CD version, or the super cheesy dialogue on the CD version, versus the witty comic style writing used in the Genesis, are just a couple of examples. This man has been hurt, officer. I don't care what you say he's done. I can't let you disturb him until his condition stabilizes. Okay, Doc. 
But sooner or later, that mask has got to come off. Spider-Man feels like a loser dunce here, and that's not a good thing. Don't do anything I wouldn't do while I'm gone, Bubbles. It's like Zelda on the CDI. Anyways, I'm not going to cover the main story beyond this as it's similar in a bizarro world style that makes it weird and worthy of experiencing yourself, but not worth recapping in its entirety during this two game review. There is a ton of animated cutscenes, voice acting and things to do. There are a lot of new areas to explore, but only a handful will progress the storyline. Each of the original levels received expansions and it's a welcome addition. The backgrounds and character sprites have been redrawn and reanimated. A new soundtrack is included featuring Red Book audio done by the master of Sega CD game soundtracks, Spencer Nielsen. Beyond the soundtrack, the biggest addition is new villains and stages. Mysterio, Vulture, Bullseye, and Typhoid Mary are all new. And Venom gets his own level that produces a fight very satisfyingly similar to Sandman's. To be blunt, some of these additions are welcome but a bit disappointing. Things such as Bullseye and Typhoid Mary having no storyline to go along with their appearance and their stage being a boring blue hallway or the addition of the downright awful Mysterio level. Really, I have no idea how this got past quality control as it's painful to play through. The only redeeming thing is that it's short and Mysterio is a pushover guaranteeing that you won't need to revisit this level again. The timer in this game is absolutely pointless due to the way the password system is used. If you turn the game off and continue using the password provided, the timer resets to a full 24 hours. This means beating this game is way easier than the Genesis version. Speaking of easy, this game is a cakewalk. Most of the movements and moves have been updated, allowing you to breeze through the levels without much trouble, as they really weren't designed for this. You can now transition from wall to ceiling, fixing a complaint I had in regard to the Genesis version, but at the same time, making many of these levels easier to navigate. Bosses I struggled with in the Genesis version are laughable here. The giant ape, now one of the easiest fights in the game. In fact, I didn't find any of this to be difficult, with Doc Ock now being the toughest villain in the entire game. It's really sad too, because every villain, save for Sandman, has a new pattern, and what worked in the Genesis version just doesn't work here. Let me back up a minute though, and talk about the HUD along with some other changes that seem small, but are in reality major game changers. First off, the photography aspect of the game has been removed as has returning to Peter Parker's apartment to restore your health. On the main screen, your remaining money is no longer shown, but when you're fighting a boss, their health is. I was thankful when fighting Venom as it was instantly clear that I wasn't winning this match mono a mono. However, it made it super easy to figure out what was working and what wasn't, unlike the Genesis version, allowing me to blast through all the new parts with ease. When you pause the game, you will see that the web shield is still there, the camera has been replaced with a worthless web bolo, and the icon allowing you to return to your apartment now allows you to return to the main map. So the web shield, something so worthless I don't even remember using it once in my Genesis playthrough. Imagine my surprise here when I equipped the shield and found out it made beating King Pin as easy as a standard street thug. He's super easy to hit now, and it's quick to take him down. Yeah, I think this is broken, and in a bad way. Although there's a lot more I can go on about in regard to this version, I think I have covered everything important, with the exception of one thing. And that is the pinball game. It's real, it's in the game, and oh man, is it bad. So how do I really feel about this game? Well, the voice acting and animation is bad, but in a way that might make you smile. It made me smile, but I know it's not something most people will appreciate. If you're into this style of cheesy animation and dialogue, then this is worth the cost of admission alone. It's a really rare case where a game adds a fair amount of new content 
great new music, massively improved backgrounds, and updated graphics at the expense of the foundation and flow the game was originally based on. I also want to note that this is the easier title by a sizable margin. And it's a good thing if you're in this for the oh so bad there is CDI good animated cutscenes. I really enjoyed this game, and if you made it this far in the video, I think you will too. My final score, 6 out of 10. In the end, it's apples and oranges as to which version you might prefer. Me personally, I give the edge to the Genesis version, as it just flows better and really reminds me of the comic. In reality though, these are a great pair of games. The Genesis version set the mark for what cartridge-based 16-bit superhero games needed to achieve to be considered good, while the CD version knocks it out of the park in terms of reworking content from an older title designed for re-release worthy of owning in addition to the original. It's one of those rare instances where both copies should be experienced and in your library. Thanks for watching. Feel free to leave a positive or negative comment letting me know your thoughts. Click subscribe and leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Until next time, I'm Genovi and this has been Retro Impressions and Reviews.